Hey and welcome back to Intro to Forecasting. What I want to do today is just get you to the point where you can make a half decent forecast on quite a lot of different questions. The reason for this really is that so much of improving forecasting is just about practice and by the end of the day I hope you're going to be at the point where you can just do some practice and by making mistakes and getting some things right just improve yourself. That's not to say I'm going to stop the videos here but I think it's a really important starting point to actually just if you want to get better at something start doing it. So the plan for the day looks like this. I'm going to introduce you to something called a reference class and a method of forecasting called reference class forecasting. I want to just give you a little bit of a heads up about some things that it's important to know before you actually make a forecast on a question on a prediction platform. And then we're going to make a forecast together. I just want to note here that if you do some other reading about forecasting or talk to other people about it, you might hear people say things like take the base rate or take the outside view. Those ideas, though I'm not going to use those words today, essentially mean the same thing as reference class forecasting, which is what we're going to be talking about. So if you hear base rate, or if you hear outside view, or if you hear race, reference class, they're all referring to very similar things. So what actually is a reference class forecast? The basic motivation behind this is that if you want to know how likely something is to happen, looking at how often it's happened in the past is a really good idea. How you actually make a forecast is you choose a set of events that are similar to the one you're interested in. You call that set of events a reference class. Then look at how often that event happened and use that frequency to make your forecast. This is more easily understood with an example. As a really simple one, I've made this YouTube series. Maybe I want to know whether I'm going to be a successful YouTuber. First, as we mentioned in the previous video, let's have some metric for success. I'm going to go with 100,000 subscribers. If I want to know how likely I am to end up with 100,000 subscribers, I might want to consider a reference class of all of the people regularly making content on YouTube. What I could then do with that class is look at what fraction of those people currently have over 100,000 subscribers, and as a first guess, that might not be a terrible way of deciding my chance of making it into that list. This seems like a good time to say, if you're enjoying the series, why not press subscribe and then you'll get notifications about new videos from me. So in one sense, reference class forecasting sounds really simple, right? You just look at how often the thing happened historically and then use that as your prediction. In practice, it's never quite that easy. There's lots of subtleties here and I want to touch on a few of the most important ones today. Often, it's just not that clear what class of events is actually the one that's relevant to you. And in particular, a certain tension exists where you have to trade off between two things. The bigger the sample you can get, the more likely the fraction you calculate from that sample is to represent reality. However, bigger samples end up being less specific, and that can be a problem because you end up sampling events that just aren't that informative. Let's do another example. Say you're applying for a PhD and you want to know your chance of getting into the program that you like. Maybe let's start with a reference class of everyone who's applied for a PhD in the last few years. Now actually, there's already a decision you've made here, which is how many years is a few years. It's obvious that if you go back too far, the ratio of applicants to places in PhDs is going to be radically different from today, where if you don't go back far enough, you might not get a big enough sample. Let's say you took the last five years, and this is your current reference class. Maybe you've decided you want to apply for a PhD in physics. It seems more sensible in that case to only consider physicists. But now let's say you know you want to apply to one of the top programs, maybe one of the top two universities. Maybe we should look at only physics applicants to those. But what if you've been working for a few years since your undergraduate degree and you don't know whether that timeout's going to harm you? Why don't we look at people that took time off before they applied? Or maybe you're still doing your degree and you want to look at people in your position. Maybe let's look at those. Or maybe you're really good at standardised tests and you want to know if that'll help. Or maybe you're terrible at standardised tests and you want to know if you still stand a chance. The point here is, as we start adding more and more specificity to our reference class, it gets smaller and smaller. And there's a trade-off here. In this case, actually, given how many people apply to grad school, you could probably make all of these cuts and still end up with a good sample. But in many other cases, it's much less clear which cuts are best to make. In a sense, this is a lot of the skill of reference class forecasting. Choosing the right reference class, and understanding the trade-off between size and specificity. One more thing before we actually make a forecast. When you look at a question on a forecasting platform, it's important to read it very carefully all the way through. In particular, pay attention to the resolution criteria, that is, the bit of text that says exactly what needs to happen for a question to resolve in a particular direction. Don't assume that the common sense interpretation of what the title of the question is asking will exactly match what needs to happen. In particular, People spend a lot of time saying things like, oh, I think there might be a second wave. But exactly what counts as a second wave, whether it's a number of cases, a number of deaths, a number of hospitalizations, or some combination of the three, 
isn't clear until you put exact details down. It might be that you could have a cutoff for each of those things that reasonably counts as a second wave, but if you're not going to have them all happen in the same day, and it's unlikely that you are, then which one counts for the resolution of the question is important to pay attention to. Essentially what I'm saying here is be pedantic. Pedantry is a pretty annoying quality in a friend, but it's a useful one for a forecaster, at least within the context of predicting on a question. Okay, let's make our first forecast. So I've picked a question here that I think has a very obvious reference class we can use, in fact a couple of sensible choices. The first thing I'm going to do is just read the question really carefully and check I understand what it means. So actually, in this case, having looked at the question, I think there's a good argument for essentially just trying to predict whether, in the sort of natural language of the term, the USA will enter a civil war. It's important here that it's possible, with slightly worse resolution criteria, or at least slightly less careful ones, that we could have had a positive resolution just because some random newspaper decided to write an exaggerated story about how a whole bunch of protests seemed quite similar to a civil war. Here we have two out of four very reputable, very serious news sources needing to describe the USC as literally being in a state of civil war. This seems to be a close enough map to actually being in a civil war that that's what I intend to predict. The next thing we want to think about carefully is how long this question has to resolve. Specifically, it's about whether the US will enter a civil war by July 2021. So in this case, what we might want to do is simply work out how often the USA has been in a state of civil war in the past and then adjust that for the time periods that's left in the question. This question has been well written in that actually there's a good data source linked in it. Doing good research in order to find information for your forecast is an important enough topic that I want to spend an entire video on it. But I will say to start with that, especially for topics that aren't political hot buttons, just looking at Wikipedia is often a really good starting point, especially when the information that's on there seems to be fairly unamb unambiguous. Something like whether a country entered a state of civil war seems to be something that it doesn't take too many reliable references to confirm one way or the other. So when I'm thinking about this question, there's actually two different approaches I could use. One is I could consider the USA to be in some sense exceptional and look at the history of the United States, work out how many years it's been around for and then how many of those years a civil war started. If I say the US has been around for about 250 years and has spent four of those years roughly in a civil war, that gives me a chance if I randomly select a moment in time, of about 1.6% that the USA is currently in a state of civil war. Of course, I get a base rate even lower than that if instead of saying the USA spent four years in a civil war, I just consider the number of civil wars that started, and I treat this question as how many times or how often does a civil war start each year, rather than what fraction of years are in a civil war. However, there's another approach here, which is to say maybe the US isn't so special, and we should consider a whole bunch of different countries. This is actually why the list of civil wars in Wikipedia is really useful. I think it's important to then say, now we've increased the sample in that way, we can do something really useful, which is consider only post-World War II in our time period. There's a good reason for this. Given the unprecedented scale of World War II, it seems reasonable to consider the possibility that the frequency with which countries enter civil wars might have changed since. This also maps nicely onto some other things like development of different technologies, nuclear weapons in particular being something that many people have posited as having dramatically changed the risk both of wars when they do happen but also the risk of them starting. If you add up all the civil wars that have happened since 1945 as well as all the ones that are ongoing, divide that by the number of countries that exist in the world multiplied by the 75 years that they've been around for, you get a much lower base rate, about half percent chance of a civil war starting per year. If you think maybe the level of development might affect it, you could choose the top 30 or so most economically developed countries in the world, look at how many times civil wars have started in those, in that case you get an even lower chance, about 0.1% per year. When it comes to this question then, it seems fairly clear to me that we'd need a pretty significant update from the base rate in order to go above the 1%, which is the minimum you can predict on Metaculus. So I'm fairly happy predicting 1% in this case. I'm going to encourage you to sign up for an account, so you can click register. Uh, you can just use Facebook or Google, those are the sort of things, or you can obviously choose your own username. This is mine. You can look at my record if you like. Once you've done that, signed up and logged in, just press predict. I do really want to emphasize again that it's worth signing up here because over time you can track your predictions, you can track how well you've done, 
and that's going to let you start building up a picture of which areas of your forecasting you want to improve, you want to focus on. More on that in the next video. Okay, go and make your first forecast.